This is Football at Four. Football at Four is powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. And, of course, you can check that out on all podcasting platforms. And check out their YouTube channel. Just search Inside the Birds. And uh, it is brought to you by, I'm thinking because I keep saying the podcasting platforms. So far, I dislike Spotify and I don't like YouTube. I need Google Podcasts back. And I will explain why momentarily. But... Football at 4 is brought to you by Bet365, whatever the moment, whatever the sport, it's never ordinary at Bet365. Jeff Mosher is here from Inside the Birds and the Inside the Birds podcast, and he joins me now for Football at 4 on the Sports Bash. What's up, Mosher? What's up, Mike? It's uh, it's an amazing time. We got the NCAA men's tournament final tonight. Right? You're a UConn and, uh, guy, right? Masters. I am a big, and trust me, I'm, I'm glad I've been busy today because I'm, I'm trying not to have that sort of day-long anxiety that sports fans have when, uh, you know, it's that night championship game, and man, does it start late at night. But uh, I feel good, but it's still, to me, a little, you know, you never, you never want to be too confident, even if you are the favorite. Yep. Uh, well, guess what? Uh, they're going to win tonight, so don't worry about it. It, <laughs> it should be good. Um yeah, I know that uh, you're a big UConn guy. You got the uh, Phillies. You got the Flyers still holding on there, although they had a rough weekend. You've got the uh, Sixers playing really well, and of course, there's yeah. always the Eagles. Who, uh, man, they always seem to do something to give us conversation, no matter what time of the year it is. They have a lot of needs to address ahead of the draft. But I want to get your take. I don't know that we talked to you last week. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Mylata's extension and kind of his place in this league. I mean, what a story this is. Uh, but what does this say about what the Eagles think about him? And now they got that left side of the line locked up for for quite some time with him and Dickerson this offseason. Yeah, that's a big part of it. That left side of the line that you just mentioned, obviously is huge for, for an Eagles offensive line that will enter this year, right, with some question marks, obviously a new center, for the first time in more than a decade and in Cam Jurgens, who it's going to be, let's be real about it. Is he going to play at hall of fame level? I, I don't think we, that's fair to expect. So there's a little bit of a question mark there, not just in terms of level of play, Mike, but also everything that Jason Kelsey did from a center point, from getting them out of play, bad, play, bad plays, calling protections, things like that. Cam Jurgens has to learn all of that as well. Like Jason Kelsey did earlier in his year, his career, if you remember, Kelsey stepped into a situation. The Eagles weren't very good. They were supposed to be good, but they were sort of starting their downfall under Andy Reid, but that enabled him to not have so much pressure on him and and really learn the position so that when they were rebuilding, he was ready to do that. So, uh, yeah, the left side of the line, young, dynamic, Landon Dickerson extended. And Jordan Mailata is interesting to me, Mike, because left tackle to me in the NFL is sort of like quarterback when you're talking about the elites versus the very good versus the, the goods. And then you get into your average and below average, right? When you look at NFL quarterbacks, there's probably maybe two or three guys that you would consider elite. I know everybody's different. You know, you got your Patrick Mahomes who's sort of in a tier unto himself, but I think people will put say the Burrow and Josh Allen in there as well, and Lamar Jackson. And then maybe after that is when you start to separate a little bit from the pack. I think left tackle is the same way. Jordan Mailata, I would say after watching games last year, there were times on the podcast where I'd say, you know what, Jordan Mailata got beat by this guy. He had a little bit of a a rough time. He he certainly did against the Patriots, certainly did against the Jets, certainly did against um, Chiefs, some other teams where he just wasn't great. But then you think about it and it's like, A, the story is unbelievable from where he came from to where he is. I mean, a guy who played rugby and had never played, played football before, then being a seventh-round pick, then having the back injuries. It almost seems like that's ancient history now because he's been the left tackle for the last few years. Um, but clearly, he's not yet, and he may never be, a like Jason Peters type of unbelievable left tackle. I don't know if he'll be Trent Williams or Tyron Smith, but there's just not that many great left tackles in the league. So if you want to tell me, Jordan Mailata, and we talked about this in the podcast today, and myself and Adam Kaplan, is top five, top six. I don't know that I can argue with you in that as far as left tackles. And, and that's, by the way, why you're going to see about seven to eight to maybe nine offensive tackles taken in the first and early second round of the draft this year because there's just not that many really good ones. Yeah, so while I've been critical of him at times last year, Jordan Mailata, because his play can be a little bit erratic at times, pass protection, he's still – 
when you compare it to the rest of the league, a really good left tackle, and that's why he gets that contract. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because it's him and Dickerson, and as you mentioned, Jurgens. That, that tri- trio could play together now for, you know, four, five, six years, similar to what they had with Kelsey, depending on how Jurgens is. You got Lane Johnson on the other side. He still has, what, two or three more years left on his deal. Uh, so I imagine when we're taking a look at draft needs, that right guard spot is going to be very interesting. Do they think they have someone in-house to kind of connect that five-man line, or do they feel like they've got to kind of land that guy maybe in this draft? It's a good question. A lot of this is Jeff Stoutland and what he sees and what he believes. When Jeff Stoutland likes a guy, he'll advocate for him, he'll coach him up, and you, you'll you'll see it either – you know, it'll work and the guy will surprise you or maybe they'll find somebody else. So Tyler Steen is obviously a guy that drafted in the third round last year. They're, I would think that they're trying to create a line that reminds them of the line, I want to say like three years ago. I think the best version of the Eagles offensive line was Jason Kelsey at center, Isaac Samalo at left guard, Brandon Brooks at right guard, and then Mylotta at left tackle, Lane Johnson right tackle. Uh, Sam Amalu was a really, really good guard. And he struggled with injuries, but when he was healthy, he was fantastic. He had very strong hands, and he was a good athlete. In fact, when he came out of Oregon State and was a third-round pick, by the way, just like Tyler Steen, there were some people who projected him to play center and be Jason Kelsey's uh, eventual replacement. But he wound up obviously staying a right guard. Um, and then he moved to the left guard, right, when they when they had Brandon Brooks. Or was it left or I forget, either way. Um so let's see what we get from Tyler Steen here. He's in year two. It wouldn't surprise me if the Eagles drafted on the offensive line because they do that anyway. They like to be a year ahead. And it wouldn't surprise me if they still went out and got themselves. What we've been talking about on the podcast is a veteran depth piece who could step in and play five, six, seven games if need be and hold the fort down. I'm not sure they see that out of Matt Hennessy. He's a guy who started some for the Falcons. I'm not sure he played at a high enough level to say that you'd feel confident that he could, could fill in five or six games for you. He has snapped at center before, so that's really important depth they have behind Jurgens. Um, but I think of, again, recreating what made them special in the past. You had Steph Wisniewski, who had been a five-year starter for the Raiders and the Jaguars before he joined the Eagles as a backup. And then he obviously got thrust into – starting left guard when Sam Allo at that point just wasn't ready uh, and they won a Super Bowl with Steph Wisniewski at left guard. So is there someone out there? Yes, there is. I don't have a name for you, but I've, I know that there are guards on the market right now who've started a lot of games in the NFL. They're veterans. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Eagles looked at that market and said, we still want a guy like that just in case. Uh, Jeff Mosher from the Inside the Birds podcast, Football at Four. Maddox, uh, he is back. Some stability to that slot area. What does that mean? Uh, do you think he is the starter? Is it just, hey, a high risk, uh, low, re- you know, low, re- re- high reward, low, re- high risk, low reward situation because of his injury? You know, do they just hope he's healthy? Uh, are they hope, you know, do they say, hey, we have, we've addressed that position? I think that signing is very interesting because I think people, when he got released, just figured he was gone. Yeah, no, not us. And, you know, on the podcast, we said that, low risk, high reward, by the way. I had you. I knew what you meant. I, you know, <laughs> listen, you're a professional. You're going to figure it out. <laughs> but um, look, the, the thing about Nickelback is that there were about 50 of them on the market this year, and they were all somewhat similar, other than Kenny Moore, who wound up re signing with the Colts, right? Who was very talented. But the rest were all pretty similar in that they were good, good players experienced players, but all of them have dealt with injuries. Maybe Maddox a little bit more because his injuries have been severe. But to us, it felt like, look, if you're going to go out and get a new nickel back, but you're just bringing in a veteran who has an injury history, why wouldn't you just bring back Avante Maddox? So obviously they, they moved on from him because at the time the cash and the cap was too high for, for what he's been giving you in return. He went out, tested the market, had that visit with New Orleans, Clearly, there was not a great market for him. Again, there were so many nickelbacks out there. He is a good player when healthy, but that's that's a big asterisk about the when healthy. So the Eagles bring him back. I thought it made all the sense in the world to do it. But I also don't think, Mike, that like right now, as we see here today, you would have to consider him the leader in the clubhouse. 
Uh, although they did sign Tyler Hall, he does have nickel experience. He played with the Raiders, I believe it was last year. He's got some, some, some good playing time in the NFL, and they like him. They gave him a decent amount of guaranteed money for a one-year deal. So there's a competition right off the bat between Maddox and Tyler Hall. But this draft is full of versatile corners, starting with hmm. Cooper DeJean in the first round, right? Max Melton, kid out of Rutgers, can play inside, can play outside. I, if the Eagles draft a guy day one or day two who they think can play inside, outside, I think you would have to consider that guy the leader in the clubhouse. And no, no one's saying you can't have two guys, you know, in depth and everything like that. But it'll be a really interesting competition at training camp. Yeah, I, I, and the, the interesting side note from that I want to get your opinion on is because I know there's a good corner, you know, group. The Eagles have so many guys on this roster that they have taken flyers on late in the draft or undrafted rookie free agents. It feels like there's like six of these, you know, the the Eli Ricks and the Makai Gardners and uh, the Ringo. Uh, they're just three of the names, but there's a bunch of these guys. So do you think if they don't take one early that they're not going to keep throwing the dart later on in the draft to some of these guys because they have so many of them? It's a good question, but I don't think they'll be afraid to throw a dart because there's none of them that they've brought in. First of all, you need a lot of corners and, and defensive backs anyway, um, just in general for, for OTAs, for camp and all that. Not to mention they have the kid from the Colts, too. Package world. The kid from the Colts, too, if he gets reinstated. Right. Yeah, no, I don't think they'd be afraid to throw a dart because if you, you hit on a guy that you drafted this year, then you have no problem moving on from a guy who may have been, you know, like a Josh Job or uh, – or a Ricks or, or whatever who's been with you for a year or two years that you just don't see ever playing a significant role for you. By the way, uh, you talked about Jordan Maialata when he got signed. He was in that draft class with like five guys in it, right? I think like four of the five guys. There they had Sweat, Goddard, Maialata. Who else was in that draft class? <laughs> Uh, so that was – that's a great draft class, one of their best ever. Yeah, they right. had five – they drafted round. five players in that draft too, right? And it's amazing. Yeah, Maddox was the fourth-round pick in that draft. So uh, Mylotta, Maddox, Sweat, uh, the first-rounder was – I think they I took Goddard say, in the second round. Yeah, Goddard in the second round. They didn't have a first-round first first round pick. Them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and so that was, what, the 2018 draft. They draft five guys amazingly. I think Matt Pryor – Yes. Was also in that draft, and he's still in the NFL. Yeah. So Pryor's the only I mean, guy. Really... Pryor's the only guy that's not still with the team. Correct. Which is an excellent draft, and sure helped them out because just two years later they would draft eleven guys. I think in the 2020 draft, Mike, eleven guys. How many do you think are still with them? Twenty twenty. That's the COVID draft, right? Uh huh. Uh, no, I thought 2019 was the co- either. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. 2020, the COVID draft, right? Oh man, uh, 2020. I'm trying to think of who the first round pick. That's generally how I can like. Jalen Rager was your first. Ooh, geez. Probably Correct. now. If you go look, I don't have it in front of me. I think they took 11 players in that draft. You can double check me on that. Um, how many do you think are still with the team? Three. Double check it. I think it's just one, and I think his name is Jalen Hurts. Oh wow, I got it right so here. All right, J- mistaken, here you go. Right? Ready? First round was Rager. Here right? you go. Ready? Rager. Uh huh. Jalen uh-huh. Hurts. Okay. Davion Taylor. Ooh, jeez. No, out of the league. Kayvon mm-hmm. Wallace. Kayvon Wallace. No, Kay- come on. All right, Kayvon Wallace. Yep. Yeah. Jack Driscoll. Yep. yep, not with the team anymore. John Hightower. Not with the team for the last year. Sean, more. Sean Bradley. Okay, he's technically a free agent, right? He's coming off the uh, the injury, so who knows if he'll be back or not. Quez Watkins. Not with the team anymore. Prince Tenga Wanogu. <laughs> he's been with the Chiefs for about three years now on their practice squad, I believe. And Casey Tuhill. They drafted 10 guys in that draft. Wow, that's a massive One. fail. And the funny thing is, remember what we all thought of the Jalen Hurts pick at the time? We didn't, we didn't think, well, of all the picks, we thought, man, that one makes the least amount of sense. That guy winds up being uh, your franchise quarterback and 10 guys, uh, the, I'm sorry, the other nine, not even with the team. That is why, Mike, you're seeing Howie Roseman have to sign a bunch of guys to one-year deals both last year and this year because when you miss that badly, 
on a 10 player draft and you don't have anybody retained other than one guy, it's not good. Yeah, I was going to say so that 2020 draft, how much has that impacted what this team looks like now? Well, let's throw it. Maybe wide receiver, they had to go out and trade for A.J. Brown, which means they had to give up an asset instead of having the asset already there, right? Um, and now they're really – they have A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith. They're really hurting here, theoretically, at depth. I mean, they bring in Devontae Parker. They bring in Paris Campbell because they don't have John Hightower here, and Quez Watkins uh, did not work out. So that, that hurts them in that regard, right? Kevon Wallace is a safety. They've been trying to hit on a good safety for a long time. He never – Never was able to be a starter for them. Davion Taylor, third round pick. Oh, I mean, it's not the kid's fault. He was way overdrafted. I mean, we had personnel people tell us that, you know, he only played Colorado for a year, two years. So he hadn't played much high school football. He was more of an athlete than a linebacker. We had people telling us he was day three or priority free agent, Mike, and they picked him in the third round because. Jim Schwartz didn't get Kenneth Murray in the first round, so they needed to get him a linebacker in the third round. That is hurting them. Yeah, the fact that he couldn't play also didn't help them either because he didn't give them anything. I mean, he absolutely gave them nothing. Driscoll gave him a little bit. Um, He's played a little bit. Other than that, Bradley's been on special teams. Watkins got a lot of snaps, but nothing of significance. Yeah, the rest of those guys, man, that draft was a real big-time miss. But uh, can you imagine if Jalen Hurts had not become what Jalen Hurts has become? I mean, how, this would be an all-time, all-time stinker of a draft if not for Jalen Hurts, and he only just makes it barely passable. <laughs> well, listen, it, well, it's an interesting, you know, like uh, big picture of like, you know, hey, they failed miserably in this draft, and yet they made it to a Super Bowl and still have been a pretty good team. You know, like, yeah. and the Rams, like what they did, like where teams kind of devalue in the draft. No, but it it shows that there are other ways to cut other paths to take, but it does affect the way you do stuff. But I think some people say, look, because of this miserable draft, you ended up with AJ Brown and Devontae Smith, which is a good thing. Yeah, but I don't, I don't like that. That because that that's sort of like the apologist version. Like because this happened now. What if you had had? What if you're first round pick wide receiver was really good. And then you were able to use that extra first round pick to trade for a really good cornerback, which you've been lacking for quite a while, right? Then, then maybe you wouldn't have been in that position where you went to the Super Bowl. That's great. But then the next year you lost seven of your last eight games. I think that it explains why the Eagles are more of a peak and Valley. Say a team like the Ravens, right? That's always going to be in that 10, 11 win range are always going to be in the playoffs. A little bit more consistent. That, that to me, is maybe the, the separator between the Eagles and some of those teams that are just a little bit more consistently up there. Uh, I don't think I asked you this last week. You were on Wednesday. I think Brandon Graham may have said this later on in the week. But did you hear him say what he thought the reason why the team uh, pulled down the stretch? Did you hear that comment at all? I did not. Uh, all right. So he was doing, like, the car wash over at ESPN. This is what Brandon Graham said when he was asked about what went wrong with the Eagles last season. Take a listen. I didn't think we had all the right coaches in the proper spots that could help us whatever the side message was because it was just a bunch of miscommunication. That's all. That's what I would just say. It was just miscommunication that I know how we uh, regret it after the season. He said we didn't have the coaches in the right places at all. Coaches in the right places. Well, I mean – I'm not 100% sure what that means other than that just sort of, again, speaks to the confusion and the discombobulation that we talked about quite a bit uh, with the defensive coaching staff. You have two different defensive coordinators, so I think that maybe he's probably alluding to Matt Patricia trying to be the defensive coordinator of a Fangio defense that he's never had to coach before, if that makes sense. So I'm coaching a different spot than he's, than he's used to. Yeah, and, and the reason we highlight that a little bit is because Brandon's one of those guys that, like, sometimes he's so overly positive that you kind of have mm-hmm. to take what he says kind of like, ah, eh, he's just a positive. But for him to come right out, like, I don't think we had the coaches in the right places. It was like, well, that's interesting. Yeah, well, yeah. But it goes to explain a whole lot. As to, And we already knew this. We knew that there were coaching issues going on on defense, especially last year, and that was causing a lot of consternation among the players, especially the veterans. And that's why they cleaned house. 
Cleaned house. We got the draft coming up. By the way, draft is in third. Uh, we got uh, what about eighteen days to the draft here, uh, the twenty fifth, and of course we'll be live at Top Golf Swing Suite at Ocean Casino Resort, and uh, we'll have that for you right here on the Sports Pass. All right, Mosh, good stuff, man. All right, Mike. Talk to you Wednesday.